it is time for us to spend some time in prayer this morning, and it's so good for us to be able to talk to God directly. So we're going to encourage you to pray for the needs that we're going to place up on the screen, and we want to you also to pray for uh, the Nash family, also for Linda, and just specifically lift her up in prayer. But then let's also spend some time as we now look at the video that also brings to our mind uh, other requests that we can pray for. Those of you that are watching on our Facebook page, uh, we pray that you will also join us in this time of prayer. Father, we thank you for this time of prayer and we, your grace is sufficient for us and for these needs. And to this, God, we have asked that you will meet each one. For your own namesake and for your own glory to be seen and to be known. We pray this in Jesus' name.
today, let me remind you that Wednesday night is our Wednesday night prayer meeting. This past Wednesday, we had a good season of prayer, and we also had some new ones and a really good turnout for our Wednesday night prayer meeting. So be here 6.30 uh, to 7.30. We spend time here in prayer. Uh, next Sunday, we will also meet for our two-service format, but as most of you know, on July 5th, which is in two Sundays, we will go back to one service at 1015. We also will uh, show that on our Facebook page at a different time at 1015, which will be live. We will also then expand to having children's ministry, children's church will be offered then, as well as nursery doing, during our morning worship service. So that starts two weeks from today on July the 5th. God bless you. Brother Stewart. <clears throat> Please stand with us again.
Thank you, Stuart and team, for leading us today in worship. Today it's going to be a little different um, in our approach to uh, the scripture. We're going to kind of do a mix of preaching and a mix of Bible study as we continue in this new series that we are in called The Quest, Pursuing the Riches of Christ. We're looking into the book of Ephesians, which was written by the Apostle Paul. And today I'm going to be reading from uh, chapter 2 of this letter. And let me remind you, we have provided these study sheets. Uh, if you have not gotten one, would you mind raising your hand if you, if you haven't got one? I think everyone has one. Great. And so we're going to look together at the Word of God. I'm going to read from Ephesians chapter 2, beginning with verse 1 down to verse 10. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live, when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Let's pray. We're here today, Father, to Again, center our thoughts, our minds, and our lives around the Word. So we welcome you now to teach us, and above all, to change us. In Jesus' name, amen. We find out from this passage today that there are really four um, sections, if you will, that the Apostle Paul brings to us. The first one is really a rather negative thing. And that is, he brings to us what sin has done. What sin has done. Sin always brings death. Dead in your transgressions and sin means spiritually you have died. The one without Christ is dead. The one without Christ as their Savior is spiritually dead. And those of us who have come to faith in Christ, before we came to Christ, we were spiritually, spiritually dead. A person who is spiritually dead cannot have a relationship with God outside of Jesus Christ. It is because we are spiritually dead and nothing that we can do can bring us back to life. Just as someone is physically dead, they cannot respond to physical stimuli. Neither can anyone who is spiritually dead. They cannot respond to it. That's why it's a danger. Many, many times, for many, many years, people can go to all kinds of Bible studies, all kinds of worship experiences, all kinds of uh, sermons, and yet never really come to be spiritually alive. It kind of like goes over their spiritual knowledge, if you will. Death comes as a result of sin. Sin causes death. A person that is dead physically cannot see, they cannot hear, they have no appetite for food or for drink. When one is spiritually dead, they cannot spiritually hear, they cannot spiritually see, they have no desire for spiritual food or spiritual things of God. Why? Because sin brings death. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. Death actually in the Bible means separation. 
When we die physically, what is separated? Our spirit is separated from our body. When our loved ones die, they are separated from us who remain here. On the day that Adam and Eve sinned against God, God told them, on the day that you eat, on the day that you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. Even though they physically didn't die for many, many years, on that day, they died spiritually, separated from God. We find out here that one without Christ is dead. It says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins which you used to live. This is why it is so important, my friend, for you and I to be a people of prayer. Amen. Jesus said, no one can come to me unless the Spirit draws them. This is why we must pray daily for our lost loved ones, our lost friends, that God's Spirit will come and quicken us and make us alive. Those of us that are in Christ, that's what happened to us. Whether it was through your Sunday school teacher, through your own parents, something was said that was done that God used to, 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 to get your attention. Because we find out that those that are without Christ are spiritually dead. The other thing that we find out here in verse 2 and verse 3 is one without Christ is spiritually disobedient. On the day that the first sin was ever committed by Adam and Eve, it was disobedience to God's command and God's will. From then on, men and women have been walking in disobedience to the will of God. And we find here that disobedience came then and that we are all a part of disobedience and that that comes in three ways. The first way is through the world, he talks about. This world system, what the world values, what the world puts uh, attitudes towards, and the world seeks to mold you and make you into its way of thinking. Whether it's through the media, through entertainment, through the philosophies of this world, the world is an avenue that seeks to draw you away from God and to draw you into sin. The second one is the devil, the prince of the air he refers to, Satan. Satan comes along and he speaks to us and he always speaks to us in his native language, which is a lie. He mixes truth with a lie. Sometimes he comes in a form of intimidating us, making us fear fearful. He brings things and makes them worse than what they really are. He entices us. Why do, why, why do you think you do it? You believe a lie that he presents to you, and you act on it. This is what is known whenever we disobey, it's because we have been led. The third one is our own flesh. Not the flesh and blood of our bodies, but the sinful nature that we have been born with. The sinful nature that demands its own way. The world, the devil, those and our spiritual nature will lead us away. They are the enemies of God and they will lead us away into being disobedient. And we find out that those that are without Christ are disobedient. Next, we find out that the one without Christ is depraved. That's a strong word. Depraved means to be, it means to be morally bankrupt, morally corrupt, wicked. A person without Christ lives to please him or her Self. They're not interested in pleasing God, nor do they even really think that way. Their actions are sinful because their desires are sinful. Now, it doesn't mean that an unsaved person can't do something good. Jesus said, even though you are evil, you know how to give good gifts to your children. It doesn't mean that they can't do anything of good. It means that they spiritually have nothing within them to make things right between them and God. That they are spiritually dead. That they are walking in disobedience. That there is a depravity in them. And then lastly, those without Christ are doomed. We find that in verse 3. The children of wrath. The children of wrath. 
Those without Christ are already condemned. What it means, it just means that the sentence hasn't been carried out. The, the verdict is already in. We all stand condemned. But because of God's mercy and grace, he withholds the, the, the penalty of that in order to give us to, in order to give us the opportunity to accept Christ. Look what Jesus said. We all know John 3.16. But do we know what John 3.18 says? Which is the words of Jesus. He says this. Whoever believes in him is whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only son. Nobody can save themselves. Right. Now, that we have looked on what sin has done, let's now focus and take our attention to now what God has done, which is the second point of what Paul brings to us. Here is what God has done in verses 4 through verses 9. Let's turn our attention to it. God has demonstrated his working in our lives through four ways. The first is this, that God loves us. That God loves us. It's recorded there in verse 4. The Bible says that God is love. It's a part of God's nature, part of God's character. It's an attribute of God. And what an attribute is, it's a quality, it's a feature of his character and of his nature. God actually has an attributes in two different ways. He has these attributes that he possesses. For example, God, God possesses life, holiness, truth. Those are his attributes. Now, how he relates to us, his creation is in different ways. Let me show you some examples. We all know that God is a God of truth. In fact, there is one thing that we know that it is impossible for God to do. God cannot lie. It's against his nature. It's against his character. If he were to do so, he would cease to be God at that moment. So God cannot lie. He is a God of truth. His word is truth. You can bank on what he says. How does that then flesh out to how he relates to us? He is faithful to us. So when God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you, you can take that to the bank because out of God's truth, a part of his nature and attributes, he then relates to us in being faithful. God is also a God of holiness. Holiness is a part of his character. His very essence is holy. How does he respond to us in that way? God is a God of justice. Sin must be dealt with because of God's holiness. God is also a God of love. God is love, the Bible says. So how does God then take that attribute and then relate it to us? He's a God then of mercy. He deals with us with mercy, and he deals with us with grace. Mercy is holding back that which I deserve. Grace is giving me that which I do not deserve. And God demonstrates his love for us in that way, through mercy and grace by giving us the Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus died on the cross, God showed his hatred towards sin and his love for sinners. So in this aspect, we see what God has done is that God loves us. Next, God has made us alive. Look at verse 5. God has made us alive. God made sinners alive when they were dead in sin. It's spiritual resurrection power that's done through the word of God. You know, Jesus, when he was here on earth, he actually raised three people from the dead. He raised the widow's son, he raised Jairus' daughter, and he raised Lazarus. How did he do it? He simply spoke the word. That's exactly what God does whenever he quickens, makes alive someone who is lost. It's his word. You remember, those of you that are saved, if you think back to it, you can remember when there was an impression that came upon you. When, when, when there was a, 
Uh, but it, maybe it was through your parents. Maybe it was through your Sunday school teacher. Maybe it was through a sermon. Maybe it was through a song. But it, 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 it got to you. It, it, it flipped on a light. And, and for the first time, there was a connection. That wasn't because you arrived. That wasn't because of that person. That was because of God speaking to you. Bringing you. He, 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 that's what happens when we come to Christ. He makes us spiritually alive. Spiritually alive. Not only that, God lifts us up. He lifts us up. God does not call us out of a spiritual grave to leave us wandering around a spiritual cemetery. He lifts us up into heavenly places with Christ Jesus. He lifts us up. He doesn't let us down. He lifts us up. We used to sing an old song. I sang it the first service. He lifted me out of the deep miry clay. He settled my feet in the straight narrow way. He lifted me up to a heavenly place and flooded my soul each day with his grace. God saves us and then he lifts us up to seek with Christ. To be with him, to have communion with him, to have fellowship with him, to have his strength. All of these riches that can then be ours. God lifts us up. It's an amazing thing that he has done for us. Not only does God lift us up, even though we're physically here on earth, we are spiritually seated with Christ, he then also keeps us. He keeps us. This is found in verses 7 and 9. When God saves us, it's not just to keep us from hell. Although that is wonderful, that's not the end result. Salvation is not the end, it is the beginning. God is working and he's working to keep us by his grace. God's purpose is to reveal his glory throughout all the ages through the church by, listen, by displaying his grace shown to us who are born again. This is why Paul said, he's able to keep me. I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. God is able to keep us. He is able to keep us. You see, our salvation is not a reward. It's a gift. It is a gift so we are, we are saved by his amazing grace. This is what God has done. Now let's look and see what God is doing. What God is doing. We are his workmanship. Do you know what this word actually means, workmanship? It actually means poem. We are God's poem. He, he's working a beautiful poem in your life through your life. God, you are God's workman. God is doing a work in you. How is he doing a work in you? He is doing it through the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ, he finished his work on the cross, but he is now working in the lives of believers to perfect them, to make them more and more into the image of, of Jesus Christ. How does he do that? He does that three main ways. The first is through the word of God. The scriptures, as we read it, as we meditate on it, as we feed on it, it is our life, it is our standard of faith, it is what we stand on. The scriptures. The second is through prayer. Prayer is crucial. And God pouring in the power of the Holy Spirit into our lives. Through the word, through prayer. And also, this one's not very popular. Through suffering. Through suffering. The testing of our faith. Uh, the trials. The, the difficulties, 
Those things that we absolutely, I'm with you on this, I'm with you like you would not believe. The ones, the things that we want to run away from, the things we want changed. Those things God uses in our life. What does it do? It then brings us right back to the Word. It brings us right back to prayer. It brings us right, it's just a continual dependency upon God. Because, listen, my friend, you and I are so prone to be independent of God. But we need to be dependent upon God, relying upon God, and that's what he is seeking to do in working in his workmanship. Lastly, what God is doing through us. Not only is God working in us, God is working through us in verse 10. It says this, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, for what? To do good works. To do good works. We are not saved by our good works. Can we say amen? amen. We are not saved by our good works. But my friend, we are saved by the grace of God to do good works. Right. We are saved to do good works. So there is a plan that God has for you to do good works. Now there's all kinds of works. There are all kinds of works that we really don't want to be a part of. There's the works of the law. Well, you and I can't keep the law. There's also the works of the flesh. There's also these kinds of works. Religious works. What are religious works? Religious works are this. When an unsaved person tries to do things, tries to do religious activities, tries to do things to impress God and to bring themselves in God's good graces. That's not what we're about. We are about doing good works. Jesus said, let your light be shine before men that they may see your good works and do what? Glorify your Father in heaven. I told the morning group this morning, I had the privilege of playing the piano today for Stuart. And got here at 7.30 and we went through the whole thing and then Casey and I played. And then I'm going to preach. I'll tell you, I'm just confessing to you, it's so easy for me. I don't know about you. But before the service, I had to go in the office and I had to shut the door. And I got behind the door so that no one could see me that's coming in the building with the, with the front windows. And I had to just say to God, God, I'm not relying on the fact that I'm playing the piano. I'm not relying on the fact that I'm playing a duet. I'm not going to rely upon the fact that I'm going to be the preacher today. My sufficiency is only in you and in you alone. We must remember that it is God that's making a poem out of our life. That God has called us to do good works that we would glorify God. Amen. <clears throat> Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we thank you so much that you did not leave us where you found us, lost in sin, dead, lifeless, spiritually unable to connect with you on our own merits. That we were children of wrath, but that because of this great love that you have, that's part of your whole being, you've related that to us through your mercy and through your grace. And you've come to offer us life. Thank you for what you've done in loving us Thank you for what you have done in calling us alive. Thank you for what you have done in lifting us up to heavenly places. Thank you for what you've done in keeping us. Thank you for what you're doing in us, the poem that you're making out of our lives. And thank you for the good works that you have saved us to do for the glory of God. May this find good soil in our hearts this week. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said together, Amen. 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 Well, thank you so much for being with us. Next Sunday we will continue to look in this amazing book of Ephesians written by the Apostle Paul, who is an apostle with authority to the church. 
called by Jesus, who calls us saints, and who calls, the favorite name that he calls the Lord Jesus is Christ, meaning the Messiah, the long-awaited one. So be sure, how many of you have brought your Bibles and your Bibles on your uh, smartphones? Continue to bring your word, the word of God, to the uh, services as we look intently into it. Be in prayer for us next Sunday as we meet again for our two services at 9 and then also at 1030. And then uh, two weeks from today, we'll meet at 1015 in our service. I want to say also happy Father's Day to you men. Men, as you are leaving today, the church has gotten you a little gift and card that the ushers will be giving to you as well. So I want to be sure to say happy Father's Day. And Stuart, thank you so much for leading us. Let's thank God for Stuart and for his leadership. Thank you as well for joining us this morning here on our Facebook page. We are so delighted that you have met with us. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are all dismissed. God bless you.